Welcome, welcome everyone to the 2023 Latinx Kid Lit Book Festival. Ah, I'm so excited to be here. I am Carla España, member of the Latinx Kid Lit Book Festival Educator Advisory Council, and I'm a professor in the Puerto Rican Latino Studies Department at Brooklyn College in the City University of New York. I'm also a former middle grade teacher, so I've taught sixth grade, I've taught seventh, I taught eighth. And um, so you know, I am a huge fan of middle grade Latinx books and thrilled to be here today. Before we begin, I want to make sure everyone who's joining us um, can also please read our anti-harassment policy in the chat box. You'll find it right there to the right-hand side of our screen on, on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe to the Latinx Kid Lit Book Festival's YouTube channel. And if you are a school, classroom librarian, or educator joining us, our school visit fund is back. Uh, that means that you can enter to win a free virtual visit from a Latinx author or illustrator for your classroom or library. And you can find the link to the entry form in the chat. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for. I would love to introduce Claribel Ortega, who is a New York Times bestselling and award-winning author and a former reporter who writes middle grade and young adult fantasy inspired by her Dominican heritage. When she's not busy turning her obsession with 80s pop culture, uh, magic and video games into books, she's co-hosting a podcast, Bad Author Book Club, where Claribel is also a Mar Marvel contributor and has been featured on so many uh, places like BuzzFeed, Bustle, Good Morning America, and Deadline. Woo! Okay, we're so excited you're here. I know, with the, with the students earlier, we were like waving and doing that awkward virtual wave. Um, but also want to welcome the students. So we have here students from Dempsey Middle School in Delaware, Ohio. Students wave. Hey! Okay, that means you can hear me. This is great. And uh, we also have uh, Shanahan Middle School in Lewis Center, Ohio. So welcome, 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 Claribel Ortega. We are here. We are excited to be with you and to have a conversation for our Frizzy Book Club. Um, Frizzy is an award-winning book. It won the Pura del Pre, that's major. So congratulations. You got the 2023 Pura del Pre Award for Children's Text Winner and the 2023 Eisner for Best Publication for Kids. So we are so happy to be with you, Claribel. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to get to chat with the kids today. Yeah, so of course, I want to pass this along to the students. So I know we have uh, to start us off a question from Dempsey Middle School. Uh, I think Viha has a question. Um, 
what made you switch from being a reporter to an author? Uh, that's a great question. So I never actually set out in the very beginning to be an author. It wasn't like I made the decision, I'm going to not be a reporter anymore and I'm going to write books. It was more so that I got an idea for a story. And I had uh, a couple different jobs after I was a reporter. And the whole time I was working on this first book. So it was more that I got an idea, I got inspiration for a story, I worked on a book, and then after I started looking into the process of like, okay, how do I get published? <laughs> I had no idea how to do it, um, no idea how to get a literary agent or sell my book to a publisher. So the story really came first, so I never made the active decision really. Um, it just sort of happened in a way that the story swept me away and took me to where I am right now. In other words, we have to follow, like our gut, follow that story that doesn't let us go, right? So for all Absolutely. of you readers, wow, that's so that first story, which story was it that you just couldn't let go and kept following it? <laughs> so it's actually a young adult fantasy uh, called um, Witches, Punks, and Cursed Things. And it was about a witch who could turn back time. And I'm actually working on another book uh, in that world uh, because that book was set in the 80s. This book that I'm working on now is set in modern times, but it's in the same universe as this very first book that I wrote. So we'll see what happens. Thanks so much, Dempsey Middle School, for that question. I wanted to pass it along. Um, oh, sorry, I said Dempsey, that was Shanahan Middle School, but I wanted uh -huh. to them to give a chance for the other school to, um, to ask too and to start us off. Um, I think Rose, you had a question to, to get Okay, so my question is, what inspired you to white rate the graphic novel Frizzy? Sure. So, so you can't tell right now because my hair is straightened, but I have very curly hair. Um, and my mom was actually a hairdresser growing up. She had like a salon in the basement of our house. And when she lived in Dominican Republic, she had a salon in their house there. So I grew up not just going to the salon for special events, but being surrounded literally by hair and people getting their hair done and rollers. And I, I used to actually play with the little rollers that you put in your hair and like pretend they were little people. It was just such a huge part of my life. Um, and once uh, my sister started having kids and I became a Thea, I realized like, oh, what's going on? Like I would see my nieces being upset about having to get their hair straightened and crying about the process and wanting to wear their hair curly for like graduation and special events. And we were told, you know, growing up, like straight hair is presentable, curly hair is messy, all of these things. But watching a child go through it, from my eyes, it was the first time that I realized like, oh, this is not right. And then it started, it made me inspect sort of the, what I had gone through as a kid and having to straighten my hair all the time and not wanting to. Um, and my sort of like proximity to like what I believed beauty was, right? Um, and so I started to inspect that and I didn't start wearing my hair curly like the majority of the time until I got much older after college. Um, and I was like, why did it take me so long to figure this out? Why did it take me so long to figure out that I should wear my hair however I want to wear it, not how people outside of, you know, are telling me or trying to sort of like uh, fit some sort of beauty standards. Um, I should do whatever makes me feel more comfortable. And I said, I would love to write a book that expressed all of these things that I went through that I saw my nieces going through as well. So that kids had a sort of cheat code and it didn't take them as long to get to the point that I got. And also for parents and people who are still stuck in that sort of cycle of prioritizing European Eurocentric beauty standards um, so that they could learn as well, because Frizzy is really a tool that adults can use to unlearn some of those things that we've learned throughout generations. So it was a combination of my experiences, experiences of, of my niece and wanting to help kids uh, not take so as long as I did to realize, you know, beauty looks a lot of different ways. Thank you, Rose from Dempsey Middle School. Did you, I was gonna ask a follow-up about that. Um, there's a line in the first chapter in, in El Salon. I, I actually read it in English and Spanish, so I'm so happy. Oh, great. Oh, great. So we have Frizzy in Spanish, it's called Rizos, translated by Jasmine. That, yeah. that was the original title, by the way. 
Rizos? Mm -hmm. Well, I went, to, I went to the Miss Rizos hair salon yesterday in um, New oh. York. In New York City, oh. um, uh, and uh, I was showing, you know, this book to everybody there. Uh, but there's a line in the first chapter, in the Salon chapter, of um, the stylist says, uh, "Que greña, like tiene tu niña." Mm -hmm. And I was wondering about the, well, were those lines that you heard growing up, or you hear your knee, like people around you? What, like, what informed that kind of dialogue for that? Scene? Oh yeah, absolutely. I actually remember the specific time I went to a salon and the hairdresser was sort of just like uh, sucking her teeth and just going like oh, with my hair. And she was, and she said that she used that word. She said greña, right? And she was like, oh, you must really damage your hair all the time. And I'm like, lady, the only time my hair gets damaged is when I come to a salon. I'm like 12 years old. <laughs> There's only so much I can do to my own hair. It's just naturally very curly, um, but like curly equaled bad for them right and it was almost like the more you straighten your hair the more you wash your curls the more you chemically damage your hair the more healthy it was in their eyes and I remember specifically leaving that the salon that day and feeling a new insecurity bloom inside of me like why is this adult telling me this about my hair I'm so worried and I didn't talk to anybody about it because I was really embarrassed but looking back, her words really did make such an impact on me in a negative way. Um, and, you know, the words, those words, the words that Marlene has told throughout the graphic novel were really taken from my own experiences. And I think that's why it's resonated with a lot of people, because especially, you know, in uh, Latinx communities and Dominican communities, we're all about hair. If you come to New York City and you go to a salon, uh, so many of them are run by Dominicans, Dominican hairstylists. We're obsessed with straightening our hair. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was unfortunately something that I had heard as a kid more than once. And that one time really, really stuck with me in, in the worst way. <laughs> and I can see how that's a great uh tip for us writers, and I know we have language arts classes and teachers joining us, that if there's a line that resonates or sticks with us and it, it, it triggers maybe like a strong emotion, that's something to definitely jot down and say, I want to return to it and see how I want to explore it in my writing. And I appreciate mm -hmm. it because I taught bilingual Spanish English. So I appreciate you kept it in Spanish in the English. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't, I don't, I don't know that I would be able to sort of like express it the same way <laughs> um, in English. Like you gotta say that word, greña, just there's something about it. That's another, also another great tip for us writers, right? It's like if there's there's a line in another language uh, for dialogue or something we hear in our lives and we wanna write about it, that's great. It's like we can keep mm -hmm. it in, in, in different languages. I love it. Uh, I want to return to, um, I think Emma from Shanahan Middle School has a question about um, Frisian characters. Yeah. Sure. I wanted to know what or who inspired the experiences that Marlene has with the adults in her life? Sure, Emma, thank you. Um, so like I said, most of the experiences were from my life or for things that I watched my nieces go through. Um, my oldest niece, Gigi, who is now all grown up and a dentist, um, she didn't really know how to uh, style her hair um, and her hair was really coily um, and so I helped her when I think she was like about 10 or 11 um, so I was like the Tia Ruby in that situation helping her because it, it, it is sort of like a thing that is passed down from generation to generation my mom has straight hair so she didn't really know how to teach us how to take care of our curls even though she was a hairdresser the solution was sort of like for us to wear our hair straight right so because my older sister didn't learn how to care for her curls she didn't teach her daughter how to care for her curls now, i'm younger than my sisters by like 10 and 11 years so like i had the advantage of like youtube and like the internet so i could look stuff up and learn how to uh, take care of my hair and then teach my niece how to do it so um it's, it's definitely really inspired by my own life frizzy is my most personal book and i it didn't start out that way it just sort of like happened um but a lot of it is taken from my life even uh, the part where marlene gets bullied and they put tape in her hair that actually happened to me i had to go home and my mom had to take the tape out of my hair and it was 
horrible. Um, and yeah, I just sort of like really was very honest about the experience and I tried not to uh, hold anything back because I thought it was really important to just be as transparent and open as I could about the what happened to me and then hopefully that would lead to other conversations. So pretty much all inspired by me, <laughs> my own life. <laughs> I want I want to also then follow up and ask, did you have a Camila? Did you have like a best friend who was like there for you during those tough moments? Um, I have friends, but I don't think that I really shared my hair struggles with anybody because it was like, like I said, it felt embarrassing for me at the time when I was a kid. So it was more so, sort of like struggling in silence. And the person that I went to really was my mom, actually. I'm hoping I I love that friendship with Camila in the book. So I'm hoping isn't it so every, cute? I love every, it. <laughs> they're just so real about that they and like they strategize, right? And Camila's like, all right, we're gonna find you a YouTube video. We're gonna figure this out. We're gonna learn how to do this. Um, I just hope every every kid in middle school has a friend like Camila. So I know yeah, the me too. <laughs> And if I could ask, I think Harper from Dempsey has a question too about the creation of this. What was it like collaborating with the illustrator to create your graphic novel? Uh, sure, that's a great that's a great question. Thank you, Harper. Um, so working with Rose was really fun. We actually never met until the week of our tour. It was the first time we met was the night before our tour started in a hotel in Brooklyn. So I was like, this is either going to be great or it's going to be terrible. <laughs> um, and it was great. We're good friends now. Um, Rose, actually, it took me just to give you an idea of how much work it goes, goes into making a graphic novel, specifically for the illustrator. It took me about three or four months to write and revise for Z, and it took Rose two years to do all of the illustrations um, from beginning to end. It was really, um, really tough, uh, long process, especially rendering all the hair. Uh, Rose really um, added extra layers. If you look if you look closely, you'll see Marlene's hair is more uh, detailed than everybody else's hair in the whole graphic novel. So it takes a really long time to get those details right. Um, and it was a great collaboration. It was a great process. Our uh, editor, Kiara Valdez, was amazing and was sort of like the intermediary between us. A lot of times they actually keep authors and illustrators separate because sometimes they fight. <laughs> but thankfully, Rose and I didn't have those problems. Um, but part of it was because we had someone who knew what they were doing in between us, sort of like going back and forth. And every time uh, uh, Rose finished a draft or finished, you know, a part of the process, I would give notes and we would go back and forth. And it was really Kiara between us helping the process go really well. So it was actually, you know, the easiest process for me um, in writing a book. I, uh, Kiara was such an amazing advocate. Kiara's also Dominican so and grew up with the same hair struggles. Um, so it was great to have someone like that on my side as well. And Rose and I have a lot of the same taste in aesthetics. Like we both love pastel colors and paints and like really bright things. And we were in agreement that we, because the topic of um, hair could get so heavy and Marlene was going through so much, the palette of the graphic novel really had to be lighter and more happy uh, because we didn't want any of you kids to be sad, <laughs> too sad reading it, right? Um, give you something like a little bit more joyful to look at as you're reading about this like heavy topic. So it was an amazing process and I'm pretty sure Rose and I are gonna work together in the future, so yeah. Oh, I like that little, I like that little preview hint. Um, for, for Harper, Harper or any other student from Dempsey, what were, if you could think of some emotions that came up for you as you were reading, like throw out some words to us. How were you, how were you feeling as you were reading Frizzy? Uh, I felt, I personally felt that I could honestly relate kind of, because when I was little, I was always told like, you should have your hair straightened a bit more. And I always thought that was right because I hated seeing my family struggle with my hair whenever I did have it curly. And it just, 
it just felt really relatable to me. And um, my little sister loves having her hair straight, just like I did when I was her age. And me and her are both like really comfortable now with having our hair more curly than we did. I'm happy to hear that. That's so great. <laughs> And I'll ask the same question for uh, Shanahan uh, students. Where, what were some of your emotions or, or connections that you had? Go ahead. Um, I personally already have like curly hair, but um, growing up, I would always get like, not my family, but my friends and like kids in school be told like, you should start using this in your hair. Or, like, even if I had curly hair, they would tell me to use different type of leave-in stuff and like serums to make it stick to curly and not get it all ruined and like, and I have poofy, frizzy hair. So, um, but as time went on, I learned that like natural hair is much better than like it's more you and it's more of your own style than like you attempting to do something different on it. Thanks for sharing that. And I'll open this up to um, Dempsey. I, because you brought up this uh, two-year process for Rose in the illustrations, Gladiator. Wow, that I, we're all in the chat like, wow, that's and three to four months for the revision process. I think that all teaches us to be patient with our revisions, you know? Um, I, I wanted to ask the students as a follow-up to that um, kind of information you provided for us. Were there any standout illustrations for you? Like I'm thinking for me right in the beginning, the, the hair salon scene with like the Dominican flag, like it just felt so lively to me. It was so, it was, I was like, yeah, that's where I was. I spent like all my weekends in the church because I went to the, a very uh, Dominican pastor, a very Dominican church in, in Washington Heights growing up. So I always, always on 180th and Broadway in, in New York City, I was always getting my hair straight in growing up because that's what we all did for church. Um, but that, that's a, that scene, that page for me was, I was like, yes. That was it. That was like my entire, all my childhood and teen years were there. Um, so I wanted to ask the students, like, shout out your favorite um, illustrations. Just, I, I know Rose is going to watch this at some point and we want to, you know, also let Patty and Rose know which ones, which ones you love. So I'll, I'll ask Dempsey first. Which ones do you want to share? Go ahead. So I personally love in the book. Um, there's two different illustrations I love. I love when Marlene is with Tia Ruby. I love them up in their garden working together. And I love the last scene of the book where all three of them are hugging with their curly hair. I love those. Oh, were so thank you. Was it, what was it about that garden scene, Claribel, for you that, that went into creating that? Because there's something special, right, about having people at the Yeah. Garden. So Rose did such a good job of even though they're in the Bronx, it suddenly felt like they were on an island. And the way that they framed it um, really just like highlighted like the trees behind them and like the mango trees behind them. And it was like, they could have been, you know, in DR in that moment. And they were talking about heritage and um, sort of generational trauma and how you know, uh, Marlene's mom had also gone through something similar in DR with her curly hair. So I think sort of like making it look like um, this tropical scene when they were talking about how Marlene's hair could be a representation of the island that she was from and her heritage was just so powerful. And Rose did such a good job with like framing everything in that scene. And it's also one of my favorites. I really love it. I'll give it an opportunity for another student, maybe from Shanahan. Do you have a favorite illustration or page? or panel? Um, I'd like to say that on page 173, after she saw um, her hair back in like a nice curly form, I kind of felt related. I, I related to that because I had relaxed hair at one time. And like, once my hair got fixed, I kind of felt the same way that my lady did. Oh, I love to hear that. Yeah, I love I love seeing her reaction to her curly hair. There's one scene where she's having the sleepover at the Rubies and she pulls the one little curl when she's in bed. Oh, I started crying when I saw that illustration for the first time. It was so cute. It was like she couldn't believe that her hair could look like that. And she felt so 
much pride in it and it just made me feel so happy. Thank you so much for sharing those uh, those pages. I know there's so many more and so many more scenes. Um, I think we have enough time. I'm, I know there's a lot of questions, but I think this is so nice because it gets us to talk about the illustration, but also those scenes in your craft as a writer. So I'll go back to Dempsey. Was someone else that wants to share another page? Um, I really like, I like just seeing the illustration uh, for the quinceanera. Uh, I like that scene really well because um, I've seen like different scenes of stuff like that in different TV shows, different books. And I just like seeing the different art designs for each different scene. Yes, I also really, really, really love those scenes and the cake and that one uh, splash page in particular, so beautiful. And that looks, I'm telling you, almost exactly like my oldest sister, Jenny, Sweet 16. A lot of the descriptions, because when, when you write a graphic novel, when I write a graphic novel, I write descriptions for everything. So almost everything that you see, the colors, were things that I put in there and then Rose interpreted. Um, and I was very detailed about what it looked like. And Rose had actually two things. Rose had never been to the Bronx so until our book tour. So that was very interesting to see like uh, their interpretation of it. But also, Rose had never been to a quince. So they had to watch a bunch of YouTube videos of, of quince parties. And they told me that they were, like, sobbing watching some of them because they were so emotional. But I thought it was so great how amazingly they captured it, never having been to one. Um, the motion of it, the, the sort of, like, chaos of it um, just really captured it perfectly. Did such a good job. Yes, we definitely got to tell them that we are, we, we all love that, that scene and just, um, just the details that went into not only Malena's hair, but also the emotions that are in everyone's faces, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll give Shanahan a chance to give, to shout out one more scene or illustration, and then we'll keep going with questions. And then I can actually get to some questions from the chat. So thank you for those of you dropping them in the chat. We'll get to those as well. I really like the cover page because she looks really happy and she looks like she could finally like be free oh yeah i agree i love i love her pose especially um I think it's so great. We had a couple of different options for covers and all of them were beautiful, um, but this is the one that really stood out. And I just love how her hair looks like a giant crown around her head. It's just so beautiful. I just really like the art style too. Like they're highlighting the places that should be highlighted. They're like putting shadows in the places that should be mm -hmm. shadows. I just really like it. Yeah, Rose is an incredible artist, um, and they actually have their own graphic novel coming in 2025, I believe, called Guts, and it's a young adult fantasy graphic novel, so definitely follow them um, everywhere so you can get updates on it. I've seen some of the art, and it's just it's stunning. We can't. We can't wait for their next one. This is great. Um, I think we're going to speak with uh, Shanahan. You had, I think, um, Akshara, you had a question. Which character can you relate to the most when you were in middle school from Frizzy, Ghost Squad, or Wishlings? Oh, gosh. This is great. Um, okay, so for those of you who have read Witchlings, I'm going to say I was a combination of Seven and Valley. I was very sort of like a know-it-all. I was anxious. I was uh, studied a lot, um, but I was also really angry at the world. So I was like a little bit rebellious too <laughs> at the same time. So I had a little bit of both of them, but if I had to pick, I would probably say I was the most like Seven. I love that that's that's a nice uh, way for us to also shout out your other books that I have um, highlighted here. I'm so I'm, I'm a big ghost. I started with Ghost Squad with you and then followed through with Witch Lane. Oh, um, so for those of you who love Frizzy, you got to check out Ghost Squad, ghost Squad and also uh, Witch Link series. Um, so yes, especially if you like Owl House, uh, a lot of Owl House fans mm -hmm. happen to love Witchlings and uh working on the edits for the third book right now and the cover and everything. So I'm really excited about that. And then I also think um, what's great about this is that you're, you're helping us think of what kinds of characters we could also connect 
to not only frizzy but in other books and then it helps us because i think you used the line earlier that a frizzy can be a tool that teachers can use to talk about mm. these tough issues mm. um, but frizzy for also for students teachers and for all of us readers it can also be a tool for us to think about the kinds of people that we are and the kinds of people that we want to be right i want to be the kind of friend like camila i want to be a tia to um um so in my family, I want to be the kind of tia that is like tia Ruby, right? I want to be supportive. Mm -hmm. I want to listen. Um, so thanks for creating those like very different types of characters for us too. Of course. <laughs> Some role models and mentors and, and also ways of not being. Like, I don't want to be like those bullies in that school, you know? Uh, okay, I wanted to give a chance to Dempsey. I think uh, Kari has a question from Dempsey. Um, what is the most difficult part of the writing process? Oh, gosh. Okay. So I think it's different for each book, right? Each book presents its own set of issues. Um, with Frizzy, I think the thing that was the hardest for me was my first graphic novel. So I had to learn how to write less dialogue. I'm used to writing a lot of dialogue. But in a graphic novel, if you look at the little speech bubbles, it's not really that much text, right? Like Frizzy, I believe, is about 260 or so pages. Um, you guys can look and see. I think it's around that much. But I actually only wrote about 100 pages, and that's including the description. So the first uh, draft that I sent to Kiara, uh, she was like, uh, too much time, <laughs> this is not going to fit. Um, so I had to learn how to do that, right? Um, sometimes it's the plot, sometimes it's the character. Uh, it really, really just depends on the book. I'm always trying to learn and get better at my craft. Um, so every book is a challenge for me and every book is sort of like a new thing that I have to learn and work my way through. Um, but it's never just one thing. It's always something new. So I'm never like, okay, I have mastered how to write books. I don't have any problems anymore. I can write it quickly. That doesn't really happen because uh, every book presents a new challenge. So um, so yeah, it just depends on the book that I'm writing. Uh, for the young adult that I was just revising right now, it had a very complicated plot. Uh, there was a lot of different storylines going on and it was dual POV. So I had a lot to juggle and explain in a way that didn't feel convoluted and waved down so I had to really revise it with a fine tooth comb. And we, we had a question in the chat from uh, I think it's um, a teacher here I'm reading Alexis there we go uh, David Patterson school yes I'm, I'm going through here sixth graders in Hempstead New York yes hello you had a question about um, how long the students want to know how long does it usually take to write so if you said here like from start to finish in this process for Frizzy compared to the other books, how long have they taken you to write? Uh, there are some books that have taken me over a year to write, over a year, and some books have taken me five months, some six months. Um, it just depends on, on the book. I, I would say that right now comfortably for a middle grade book about the length of a Witchlings book, which is about uh, close to 300 pages, uh, four months is um, comfortable for me to write a first draft then I have to revise it. But a first draft is usually pretty messy. Um, so uh, those books are between 80 to 95,000 words. So four months for about 80 to 95,000 words. Do you feel like you, you um, was it so cookie cutter that you're like, I'm writing a chapter every so often or is just? No, absolutely not. <laughs> there are days that I sit down and I write like 5,000 words. There are days that I write down, write five words and then I play Stardew Valley for the rest of the day. Uh, it just depends. I can't always write. Um, when I'm on deadline, obviously I get a lot less wiggle room, but I still, there are days I have to rest. Mm. I'm so happy you said that, that rest is also part of the writing process. <laughs> 100%, yes, rest is part of it. I go on a lot of walks. I lift weights because publishing can be frustrating. That's how I work through my anxiety. Um, and if, if you want to write, for anybody who likes writing or illustrating, you need to live in order to express the things that you're writing. You have to have experiences and, and live your life in order to have something to write about. So you can't just be a bookmaking machine. You have to go out there and experience life and go through things so that you um, have something to pull from when it comes to writing. Thanks for that. That's, an, that's 
we need to hear more of that. We got to live, we got to rest, and that's all part of the process. Uh, mm -hmm. Dempsey, oh no, so we have Carrie. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to, uh, to Kari for asking that that question. And um, I wanted to go back to um, a question. I'm going to keep going through the chat, and then we will go back to the to the schools. Um, sure. But there, there were questions that related to what you shared earlier from your own experience that informed Frizzy. Um, so I think the first one I'll ask from Wendy Lamont, who asked about um, how did you overcome the bullying as a child? Um, so I think for me, the bullying was something that didn't really get resolved or go away until I was older. Um, I talked to my mom a lot about it, to be honest, to my siblings, and they tried to help me work through it. Um, but it was something that sort of like affected and stayed with me until I got a little bit older and learned to be more confident in myself. But I will tell you, one of the best ways to overcome bullying is to succeed at life because uh, people who bullied me, people specifically who did the thing about putting tape in my hair, asked me if I could help them uh, with their own book ideas uh, now that we're older. Uh, but I didn't forget what they did uh, to me, but it's very gratifying to, you know, kind of keep living my life and work towards my goals and not letting those kinds of things hold me back. And I think that's really what helped me get over it. It's just focusing on myself you can't always control what other people are going to do or how other people are going to treat you, but you can always control how you behave and the effort that you put towards being the best version of yourself. And one day I focused on that. And one day I woke up and I felt really happy with who I was as a person. And suddenly those things didn't matter anymore. Um, and then I had my old bullies asking me for help. Um, and I could tell them to hit the road, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to surround myself with nice people and positive people. And yes, 100%. And uh, a question from Joan Mullen is, students want to know if it is still hard um, for you to straighten your hair after writing the book. Like, how do you make those decisions about? Yeah, actually, I feel a lot more comfortable about how I choose to express myself through my hair now. I think before it was a little bit more of like a guilt of like, oh, now I have to wear curly all the time. Um, but writing frizzy, I realized like, oh, it's more so like, what do I feel like doing right now, right? Like, do I wanna wear it curly? Do I wanna wear it straight? It should always sort of be your decision though. Like, how do I feel the most comfortable? I'm in Korea right now, and it just so happens to be easier for me to wear my hair straight so that I don't have to, you know, have such a complicated wash day because um, we have a very, very small bathroom. Um, and I make decisions based on sort of like what's easier, what my mood is, um, rather than guilt and a sense of obligation, which is like the difference now. Now I can make the decision because I feel like it rather than because someone's going to judge me over it. And it's a really nice feeling. Because if I want to wear my hair curly for an award ceremony, I will. And if I want to wear it straight, I will. Um, I also deal with PCOS and like a bit of alopecia. So sometimes uh, that dictates how I need to wear my hair, depending on how coarse it is and like how hard it is to detangle. So you know, things change and ebb and flow as you get older with how you have to uh, wear your hair and take care of it. Um, but I think that there's a lot less guilt involved in the process of how I wear it. I just sort of like do whatever feels right for me and it's really freeing and um, and and gratifying. I wanted to ask about the, and then I'll keep going back and forth. So keep dropping your questions in the chat and then I'll go back to the school to Dempsey and Shanahan. So you feel free to ask the other questions you have on, on your list. Um, but I wanted to ask about your family and the reception of Frizzy in your family. I, I'm always, I'm always curious for authors, like after your book comes out in the world and <laughs> what do people in your family say? My family is incredibly proud of me. My parents, uh, have gone to like Barnes and Noble to take pictures like with holding my book <laughs> very very cute um there has also been discussions about you know what happened with our hair when we were younger uh with like my sisters um with my nieces they felt really like sort of appreciative of um what I expressed through the book uh they felt really seen and sort of like emotional about it right um because it is a very personal thing even though so many people deal with it it feels so personal um 
So they've been great. They've been really supportive. Uh, I have a huge family. I was just in Florida this summer with my parents and I went to one of my cousin's house and they had like a huge toast for me and for all my books. And it was really, really nice. Um, But yeah, it has opened up discussions about sort of like curly hair and beauty standards and what it means to say somebody has like a cara fina like uh what what what, what's behind that right like you you're saying these words and you don't realize that you know they have colorism behind them have racism behind them you're so used to saying them that you don't even realize how much they affect you you know a kid is born with like blue eyes and blonde hair and suddenly they're like oh but god's gift right because they look a certain way and i'm like what are you saying to the kids who have curly brown hair darker skin you know you're not you're not realizing how those things are affecting them so i think they've been very grateful there's been some uncomfortable conversations but that's why i wrote this book because i wanted people to change um for the most part my family is super proud of me they're like my number one fans my mom has every bit of merch and book and signed thing that you could she has a collection she's like nobody touched this she has it in a special box um she's she's my number one fan for sure and uh and yeah I couldn't ask for more supportive parents they I don't I don't think I would have had the courage to try to become an author if my parents hadn't told me from a very young age that I could be anything that I wanted um so I'm very very grateful for them Yes, thank you for sharing that. And also for us to think about as teachers, as uh, readers, is to say how um, how can we continue using your books and other books, especially the ones from the, the Latinx um, Kid Lit Book Festival, of how can we use these books to help us have those tough conversations? Because I know I'm as a I'm now a college professor and I assign books to, to read and um, like these books in our in our festival and I have students telling me that they've taken the books home to like discuss with their families um, to help them have these tough conversations. So at first I was thinking, oh, we're just going to read the books for like us to have a conversation in class. And this could be for also Dempsey Middle School and Shanahan Middle School is thinking, how can we use these books to have conversations with the adults in our lives outside of the classroom? So thank you for that reminder, Gladybed. Uh, I wanted to go back to Dempsey, Dempsey Middle School and then Shanahan. Dempsey, I'm gonna open it up. What other question do you want to ask? I know you had a, a long list, so we still have time. Let's, let's go for another question. Yes. Um, one of my questions are, have you ever had the feeling that a family member is so much prettier, prettier than you? Did your family make a big deal about them? Did they seem to think you weren't as pretty or as good as them? Um, so I did have one cousin that that happened with, and she was like my mortal enemy when I was younger because I felt so jealous and she had straight hair and that was like, oh, the biggest deal. Um, you know, we got older and we got over it. It happened more with my friends, actually, um, especially if they were white and blonde and skinnier than me. Uh, there were comments about, oh, why can't you look more like your friend? Um, which was very frustrating because that was like, because I look like my family. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Um, so, yeah, I definitely had that experience. And that's what I sort of used as inspiration for the character of uh, Diana, who is Marlene's perfect older cousin who is just obnoxious. Yes, <laughs> that is the one. <laughs> Thank you, Rose, for that question. We have a, I, I'm gonna go back now to the chat. There was a question um, from Joan Mullen, sixth grade student that says, was it difficult to work with um, Rose? I mean, you talked about working with Rose, but if you give a little bit more of the detail is how do you collaborate with someone to bring a book to life? Was the um, Rose able to make your visions come true? I think whatever tips you can give for us writers. Um, I think in middle school, we have a lot of sometimes partner writing or group writing, we have group projects. Uh, yeah, how is that collaboration? What advice would you give to people collaborating on, on writing? Sure, um, so it wasn't difficult at all. <laughs> we were a really good match. I think that um, because our aesthetics and sort of our, our vision for the book really matched, it was, easy there was never a moment where i had to completely tell them oh i hate this 
whole panel or page, please change it. There's always small details, little things that we had to change. Um, so I think finding a person who shares your vision is really important and also communication. Like I mentioned before, when I wrote the script, a big part of it was detailed description. The more detailed description you provide to the illustrator, the easier it will be for them to carry out your vision. There are some authors who even do rough little sketches in each panel of where everything should be placed and sort of like what it should look like. And I've heard from a lot of illustrators that that is um, very helpful for them. And have you, have you collaborated with other writers um so besides rose as illustrator but have you collaborated with other writers on um or even even in collaborating on a podcast like how how does that work so you can give us tips when we have to work in groups or partnerships sure so um i hosted a podcast called write or die with the author kat cho who wrote wicked fox and once upon a key prom um for about four years um and that was really fun we interviewed other authors about their publishing journeys. And right now, um, I am co-hosting a podcast called Bat Author Book Club with uh, author Ryan Masala, who wrote The Honeys and um, upcoming book Beholder and Bedazzled and Reverie. And uh, we, I think the important thing when you're working with someone else is to find something that you're both very passionate about. And for Bat Author Book Club, we're reading um, bad books by celebrities. <laughs> We, wrote, we read Model Land by Tyra Banks, which was such an interesting read, um, about 500 pages. Um, and it was really, really fun to read. It was hard to read, but we had fun together because we both like reading these kinds of books and seeing like, what does it mean for a book to be bad? And it, it, if it entertains you, like, isn't that good? Um, and right now we're reading a dystopian young adult novel by Kylie and Kendall Jenner called <laughs> Rebel City of Indra. And it is, um, it is as, um, bizarre as you think it is and we're having so much fun just reading it together and analyzing it and going through it and talking about the different aspects of like what goes into being a celebrity writer right you get a ghostwriter but how much control do you get for for model land tyra banks wrote a big chunk of it um she wrote the majority of the book even though she had a ghostwriter um so it's really fun i think you you just have to find someone who shares your interests and who um, who you like working with and who will be patient when things go wrong, as they inevitably will, and someone you, you will be able to communicate with. Yes, great, great tips. Thank you. So we'll keep that in mind as we write with other other people or illustrate with other people. Uh, Shanahan Middle School, we'll, have, we'll take one more question from you. Does anybody else want to ask a question? Who was your favorite character to write in Frizzy? Who is my favorite character? I love to write Thea Ruby. I thought she was so irreverent and fun. And I loved to give, I put Marlene through a lot in the book. And so giving her an adult who was an ally um, in that way and who still had some of their sort of like childhood wonder and charm, right? Like Thea Ruby is still so fun, even though she's old, much older than Marlene. Um, it was fun for me to write her uh, a character who pushed back against uh, that generational trauma was helping breaking to break that cycle. Um, I also, even though uh, she has no lines of dialogue, Gunti plus the chicken was absolutely delightful for me to describe and watch come to life. <laughs> is, that, is that a series that's coming later? Are we are we working on the Gunti plus the <laughs> no. series? I, I need it now. <laughs> Not, not, no plans for a Cantinfla series unless there's a lot of demand. <laughs> All right, everyone join me in this demand. Um, so in the chat, Peter Lopez asked, what is your favorite memory from the entire experience of rele releasing Frizzy out into the world? Um, so I, during the tour, we went to Washington, D.C., and we had an event with the Open Book Foundation there, which was incredible. And uh, we gave a presentation, and I noticed that there was a group of kids sort of clustered together, and there was, like, one girl uh, sort of whispering to the others throughout the presentation, and I figured out that they didn't speak English and that she was translating for them. 
Um, so at the end of the presentation, I spent extra time with them, talking to them in Spanish because it's my first language. And they were shocked <laughs> that I spoke Spanish and that I was an author. Um, one of them said, you speak Spanish like us and you're an author. I can't believe it. Um, and they were just so great. They were asking me so many questions. They were so excited to be able to communicate with me. And it was very difficult for me to not cry uh, to the point where I did cry <laughs> because I, you know, English is my second language. And I very much remember the feeling of being lost in class. Um, and being able to show these kids that they are capable of absolutely anything that they set their minds to because I am just like them and I became an author and I'm successful and I can be a creative and be out in classrooms talking to kids. It just meant the world to me. It meant the world to me to be able to share all of that in our language. And, um, and it was a memory that I will never, never forget. On that note, I just want to take a deep breath and, and just express all of our gratitude. I think those are wonderful words to end with and to say that um, we, as you see all the love in the chat from teachers and classes joining fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, families, parents, everyone's um, so grateful. Uh, Dempsey Middle School, Shanahan Middle School, we are grateful for you for reading Frizzy, for supporting uh, this book and for sending in your questions. Much love to all the teachers, librarians, especially in these times. And Claribel, you just need to know that we, we deeply appreciate you being vulnerable and returning to those tough moments um, from your childhood and writing about them and helping us have Frizzy as, um, and Rizos in Spanish. So we have Rizos in Spanish, Frizzy in Spanish as Rizos. Thank you for, for putting that out in the world uh, with Rose. We really appreciate it. Of course, thank you all for reading it. It really means so much to me. And thank you to all the kids for all of your questions. They were wonderful and I appreciate all of you a lot. And so thank you everyone for attending the Frizzy Book Club at the Latinx Kid Lit Book Festival. We look forward to connecting with you um, throughout the sessions that are coming up and make sure you keep following us on social media. Thank you everyone. Adios. <laughs>